The Christian story is our nest. It gives us our edges. Some of you, you're like, I don't have any edges. The Christian story gives that to you. It tells you who you are and what you're for. Okay, super simple, super big picture. Foundation number one, when we talk about flourishing relationships is this, it's that the first foundation we have is that we must be and we can be rooted in God's story, in the big story of our faith. The big Christian story is what roots us as we talk about all of our relationships. Our relationships are not solely individualistic things, But if you are a follower of Jesus, you find yourself rooted in the whole story of God, all right? You know this, right? Yes, you know this. So what scripture teaches us is from the very beginning, from the book of Genesis, the garden that we see there to the very end, the book of Revelation and the garden in a city that we see there, we see what we call from creation to eschaton, from the beginning to the end, There is a whole narrative of what it means to be operating as a Christian in the world around us. And what's important for us to understand, folks, is that this narrative, this story, it forms like the nest in which we find ourselves. We know the beginning, and we know the end, and we are meant to fill out the middle. That's how you discern how to do life right now. Has anybody ever worked on a Google Doc with a bunch of people? Anybody, a Google Doc, you're working on a project, you've got like 15 people dropping into your Google Doc, and you have this perfectly well-formatted Google Doc, and you love this Google Doc because you've chosen the perfect font, and then there's always the one collaborator who drops in and they don't format their stuff right, right? and their font is all weird, and they kind of mess up the whole structure of the thing, and you can tell when something drops into the middle of the dock that doesn't belong there, right? Well, in, in some sense, understanding our big Christian story helps us figure out what belongs and what is out of place in the narrative of our life. And so you'll often see that we we will drop things into the nest or the narrative or the story of our life that don't match. And this is what the world sees when the world sees Christians and says the way that you are relating one to another in anger does not match the story because the story began in a flourishing garden and the story is meant to end in a flourishing garden and all of this hoopla does not match. It's like it got dropped into the dock, and it's not in sync. And we see that in our own lives. That's what sin is in our own life as Christians. It's the thing that does not match the story. So what we see in Genesis, and again, this is very simple, very big picture. We all know this. Our scripture begins with what? In the beginning, God created. So every Christian has a fundamental understanding of that being our foundation that we are creature and not creator we are made and not maker we forget that all the time but that's a truth that we need to understand as Christians we are not self-formulated human beings we were breathed out by the breath of God and we see this all through Scripture that we operate out of being created by and cared for God. We, we began in a flourishing garden. Now, we know that the middle of our story, the middle of our narrative gets a little bit messy, and I'm gonna take us to Jeremiah here, which is the words of the Lord uh, sort of uh, addressing the mess that we find ourselves in over and over and over again. This is the, uh, the Lord speaking through the prophet Jeremiah to his people in exile. When 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will come to you and fulfill my good promises to bring you back into place. If some of you are familiar with this text. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you a hope and a future. Then you will call on me and, and com- you will call on me and come and pray to me and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with your whole heart. So what we have when we have the Christian story is that it begins in a flourishing garden and then the whole kind of middle of it is sort of meted out in this way that Jeremiah speaks to. I don't know if you've ever heard the phrase herding cats. 
That's basically the whole middle part of Scripture. I, I, you know the hymn, prone to wonder, Lord, I feel it. That is our story. We were created by God in a flourishing space, and we are prone to wander. It's like if you're looking at a Craigslist ad for this really cute puppy, and you've always wanted this puppy, and it's strangely cheap, and you wonder why. And then you read the small print, and it says this dog is amazing, it's super adorable, it's really cute, he's prone to wander. Which means you're gonna spend your whole life chasing him outside your neighborhood, right? That's the story of people of faith. We're prone to wander. And over and over and over, God draws his people back. He seeks after his people and he draws us back to himself. That's the whole middle of our story. Through the cross of Jesus Christ, we can be re reconciled to God, even though we're prone to wander. And then we move on and, and, and the story continues and we get to the book of Revelations, the eschaton, the end and we have this picture that should remind us of what we saw in Genesis. It's a picture of another garden. Let me read to you out of chapter 22. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and the Lamb down the middle of the great street of the city. On each side of the river stood the tree of life, bearing 12 crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be any curse. The throne of God and the Lamb will be in his city and his servants will serve him. They will see his face and his name will be on his foreheads. There will be no more night. They will not need the lamp of a, or the light of a lamp or the light of the sun for the Lord God will give them light and they will reign forever and ever. Now there's much more to be said about that. We're planning a series on Revelation for some time in the future. so. We'll have a space to dig deeper, but here's the very simple, very high-level picture that I want you to understand. The Christian story is what roots us. Anytime we're asking any question about how to do anything, and the Christian story is one that begins in a flourishing space, in a flourishing garden, and it ends in this flourishing space, in a flourishing garden, the river of the water of life, the tree of life. This is the picture that Revelation is pointing out to us. It's what scripture tells Christians. This is where you're going to. You know where you've begun. You know where you're going to. And you know that in the middle, there is going to be this rhythm of prone to wander and then being invited back into reconciled relationship over and over and over with Jesus. This gives us our narrative. It's the nest in which we find ourselves. It gives us our meaning and our purpose. It gives us our direction in life, the story of God, the Christian story. Not, not you finding the best husband ever. And this is why this big picture foundation is really important for our relational uh, flourishing, my friends. Because most of us are struggling in relationships because what we are looking for our relationships to do is to define us, to give us meaning and purpose and value, to make everything okay, to give us a great sense of what we're aiming at. And instead, our relationships are doing what relationships do, they're making us tired, and they're disappointing us, and they're interrupting our plans for life. And if we don't have this sense of this grand narrative that we're a part of as Christians, and we try to get that from the people that we are relating to, we will constantly be disappointed. We will constantly be aiming at the wrong things. If you try to find the grand narrative of your life, the purpose of your life, in being the best mom ever, and throwing the best birthday parties ever, and raising the smartest kid ever, and sacrificing, and cooking dinner, and folding laundry, you know how far that's gonna get you when it comes to like your life meaning and purpose? It's gonna get you as far as to when your kid says to you, I don't like you. 
I don't like you and I don't like how you fold my laundry. I didn't ask you for that birthday party. I joke, but you know that it's true, right? You know that it's true. We spend our whole lives seeking to be defined by our relationships and, and, and putting pressure on people like our spouses to give us meaning and purpose and ultimate direction. Or you think as a single person that, hey, once I get married, it'll all make sense. But what we have forgotten is this. We have forgotten that we have a grand narrative that does that. It is the story of God in which we find ourselves. And that's all we need to know where we are and where we're going and where we come from. And our relationships are a part of that, but they are not that. There is a sort of reorientation that we have to understand fundamentally as we start talking about flourishing relationships, okay? You can think about it this way, that we are all as Christians called to be great at improv. It, you know the whole thing like, what would Jesus do? Like that only goes so far, right? I remember when I was like thinking about like, do you bottle feed or breastfeed? Like the question doesn't work then. <laughs> it's like all these really important questions that just don't work. I don't know what Jesus would do. <laughs> but here's, here's a different question. In which story do you find yourself when you're thinking about, is there really gonna be a Christian person for me to date or do I just give up and just go with whoever on, on Hinge or Bumble or whatever? Is there, really, is there really hope for this marriage or do I just give up? So, so here's what you think. You think, what story am I a part of? I'm a Christian. I, okay, my story starts in flourishing. My story ends in flourishing. My story has a bit of a muddy middle but I can trust that God loves me, that he sent his son to die for me and reconcile uh, himself to me so that I could be filled by the power of the Holy Spirit and transformed into his likeness. And oh yeah, I need to make my decisions based on that. Do you understand how this works? Yeah. Big picture, I like, the, I, I, I like the thing of the nest. It's a nice little safe thing. The Christian story is our nest. It gives us our edges. Some of you, you're like, I don't have any edges. The Christian story gives that to you. It tells you who you are and what you're for. 